Uh, so as far as I know, I'm one of the few re researchers who spend a lot of time in the water with the orca. And I, I don't just randomly jump in, just for the hell of it, you know. I, <laughs> um, I, I choose when I'm going to do it. But having said that, um, there are times when sometimes it's pretty obvious that you should get in. When the orca come and they see you putting on your wetsuit and they come and put their heads on the side of the boat <laughs> what they're doing, it's a pretty strong indication that they're interested in what you're up to. Um, so, so one of the things that I'm really, really interested in is the foraging behaviour. So this is an orca that's known as Miracle, and uh, this photograph was published in a scientific article that I did, and it got eclipsed because um, just a few weeks later, the, uh, another group of scientists saw orca feeding on a great white shark. But this was the first record of orca feeding on a Marco shark. And there's a little bit of a story behind this, and I'll, I'll try and condense it. But I was, I got the call for the orca. I drove an hour and a half to get there. I, I arrived, and um, there was somebody out in another boat, a colleague of mine, who had called me. So um, I pull in on my wetsuit as fast as I can because I, I can see the orca are up to something, so I want to see what they're feeding on. And, and Jo, she's over there waving to me, and I'm like, hey, Jo. And she's calling me on the radio, and I'm ignoring it. And my cell phone's ringing, and, I, and I'm ignoring it. And she can't come over towards me because there's orca between us, and she doesn't want to drive right through the middle of the group. So I pull on my gear, and, I, and Jo starts really, really waving. And I'm like, hey, Jo, fantastic. <laughs> um, of course, what she's trying to tell me is there's a shark there. But I'm just like, you know, really, really focused and getting in. And this is back in the good old days of um, slide film. And um, so I get into the water and my camera is still doing... You know, do you guys, some of you old enough to remember that? And you have to wait and wait and wait for the... So the first photograph I missed, which was really unfortunate because Miracle had the shark in her mouth by the tip of the tail. And the shark is swimming like crazy trying to get away. And so Miracle comes up to me and lets the shark go. <laughs> and the shark is like, excellent, now I need somewhere to hide. And it sees me, right? So it comes at full speed towards me and I'm like, oh, this is either going to be a really good photo or really bad. <laughs> So the next photograph I have is a shark so close to me that it's completely out of focus, but it's like right here. And then I'm like, oh, where did it go? Because it just went straight underneath me and it hid behind me. And so, miracle, and then you can see there's another orca just in the corner there. These two come at full speed to me, like seriously, full speed. And I'm like, oh, this is either going to be really good or really bad. And, and the next thing, my next photo is this, it's black. There's just this black bus that went past at full speed. So um, this was the only photograph that I got. So it wasn't in the mouth, but um, I turn around, trying to see what's going on. And what's happened is the shark has now seen my boat, which because I'm usually out there by myself, and the boat has drifted off. And the shark's like, oh, I'm going to go and hide over there. So there goes the shark at full speed. There goes Miracle at full speed. There goes the other orca, and there's Ingrid flat out behind them. <laughs> I get there just in time to see them rip the shark apart and feed on it. So the poor little shark didn't make it, but um, and I didn't get there in time to, to get any photos of that either, and I was huffing and puffing, so I don't think I could have. But um, it was very, very interesting to watch, and I've been amazingly fortunate to have worked with orca that are very, very um, tolerant. They are very aware that you're in the water. Uh, Kimberly and Jeff Friedman uh, have come out with me in Norway and you know you can be floating on the top there and you just see them feeding and they, they know that you're there. They look up at you but they're, they're not disturbed at all and that's the same with these guys. So um, I've seen some really incredible things. So this is an orca that's known to me as Olaf and at the front here you can see a seven gill shark. Now it's a broad nosed seven gill shark because it's very broad across the front here but they have a long tail and these guys are, they're, they're pretty bitey sharks. They, they tend to bite things, that, anything that comes near them. 
So um, the orca have learned that if you want to eat one of these types of sharks, the best thing to do is not get your face near them. Because if you put your face near them, they can turn around and bite you, and that's where your eyes are and you know your face. You don't want to be bitten on the face. So what the orca do is they'll go underneath the sharks and they drive them up to the surface. And then once they're at the surface, of course, the shark hasn't got anywhere else to go. And so then the orca swims past, and then it'll, and you can always see the shark go, oh wow, they've gone past, I'm safe. And you can just see the body posture changes. But then what happens is the orca pivots, lifts its tail out of the water, and karate chops on top of the shark. So this next picture is Olaf. And here he is, he's done one um, karate chop and he's just lifting his tail up for the next one. And you can see the shark is, is facing towards the yacht in the background there. And he did manage to, to get the shark on the next kawumpha. So that yacht took a photo of us. There you go. So this is the sort of thing, Olaf is really, none of them are worried about my boat because they have spent 20 years with this boat around them. Um, and he will sometimes actually use the boat, which I feel really bad about. So we, we had one shark that tried to climb into the boat and I was like, oh, poor little shark. Um, but yeah, then he would, that was the end of that one. Um, but there was another shark that, that we were watching and it raced up onto the beach, uh, onto rocks. Full speed, like it was incredible. And the shark launches itself from, from the edge of the, the stage here to about back here. It managed to get that far up onto the beach. And then it was stuck. So I'm like, oh my God, we can't leave the shark there. So I jump out of the, into the water about this deep and I go ahead and I got the shark by the tail and the shark's like, hell no. <laughs> and it's turning around and it's trying to bite me and I'm having to, I'm trying to use my feet because it's like the orca, I don't want my face down there. And um, eventually we managed to get the shark in and it took off um, and the orca had gone in the other direction. So that was a safe shark. But that was really quite interesting because um, somebody posted it on social media and that story went viral about saving the shark. It was, it was quite an interesting one. But this is what it looks like for the poor shark when he's been hit. And um, the orca come in and they food share. They don't typically eat the whole shark. They're mostly going after the liver. When I first started doing my research, I was sure that they were feeding on everything but the liver because I would find big chunks of liver floating to the surface, sometimes the whole liver. And now I've had this big paradigm shift and I think that they're feeding on the liver and leaving everything else. And I think that's very important as a scientist to not get locked into the ideas that you set for yourself. If you cannot keep your mind open to changes that the animals might change their behavior, or perhaps you got it wrong, then you're not um, a progressive scientist. So for me, um, this big paradigm shift, I'm trying to gather enough evidence at the moment so that I can write another paper to refute my earlier one, which <laughs> not many scientists <laughs> tend to do. Um, but the big thing that orca also do in New Zealand is they chase rays. And this is like orca chocolate to these guys. They just, they will go to great lengths. So the reason the orca's dorsal fin is out of the water there is not because she's just at the surface, but because the water is so shallow. She cannot submerge. Uh, and the ray, uh, by doing this leaping up into the air, this particular one got away, but sometimes they'll manage to grab the rays by the tail and they flick them into the air like frisbees. And what they're trying to do is flip them upside down because that induces what's called tonic immobility. And tonic immobility just means that they completely relax. They're still perfectly aware of what's going on, but they just relax. And then that means that the orca don't get stung. Now, when they get the sharks, they also flip them upside down and that induces tonic immobility as well. So the sharks, once they've got them and they've given them the karate chop and they flip them upside down, they can then come in and eat them. So here we have an orca. This is taken from a video from my boat. Um, actually, this was the same day that we got some of the footage that's used in Blackfish. And here you can see another eagle ray. And in this case, the orca's got it very much by the tip of the tail, like you would pick up a dirty sock or something revolting. Um, but in this case, he's doing it because he doesn't want to get stung. This is a two-year-old calf.
that is learning how to do this. So once they have them, like I mentioned, food sharing, so we have a mother and a calf, this female actually brought her calf over to the boat with the ray um, in her mouth and then lay beside my boat and ripped it apart. So I'm standing on the top of my boat looking straight down on them. It's not unusual for them to bring food over. Um, we've watched them bringing over the little puffer fish. Um, if you've seen... Um, Finding Nemo, I think there's one in there, and you, and you push and push and push until they, well, that's exactly what the orca do. And they'll, they'll just push this little puffer fish along, and they bring them at the surface to the boat, and then they, and the fish just, like this, and then, then they leave them. They just go off and leave them. So, um, yeah, I think it's a good strategy of the fish. But having said that, there is a dolphin um, who died in Australia, who was playing with one of these, got it in its mouth, and it went Poof. And that was the end. Because of all the spikes, it couldn't get it out, and it, and it, and it, and it died. So now we're going to try um, two last slides here. This is some audio recordings that I did in Antarctica in New Zealand, because many of you have been out on the boats, and you've heard the hydrophones, and you've heard the beautiful calls that go on here. And I wanted to put that into a little bit of perspective. Um, every different culture of orca, so it's not just the clans and the pods, have different types of calls. So in Antarctica, it sounds a little bit like uh, they're on helium, so very, very squeaky. And in New Zealand, they have a good kiwi twang, like I do. <laughs> so the first one, there's a lot of orca, there's about uh, 15 to 18 animals there and it's quite rough so you'll hear a lot of surface noise so you have to imagine that you're below the surface and just filter out that surface noise so let's see if this is going to work I don't know where John's hiding but come on seriously oh okay Well, if it doesn't work, John, I can just do it manually afterwards. Let's do that, then, when he, then he doesn't have to come. Is he? He's almost there. He's here. He's, He's here already. That was quick. <laughs> so, we'll just... Should I try it now? <laughs> One more time. Oh no, it's the New Zealand water. So can you can you hear the difference even though the first one was really short? So there's there's quite a difference to the sound. And uh, one of the projects that I'm working on at the moment is trying to do some recordings down in Antarctica um, where we've got this thing called a sound trap and we lower it over the ice and we just leave it there overnight and then we can let the orca do their thing because of course it's 24 hours of daylight down there as well in the summer um, and then we can record them while they're feeding. So we've got some remarkable calls so far and um, we're hoping that we'll be able to do some comparative studies to earlier recordings to what we're getting now. And let's see if we can go to the next page. Yep. Yeah. So this is an Antarctic orca. You can just see the ice shelf there. And um, it looks very grey and white. Can you notice that? Right. And I just want to put that into perspective because this is a black and white one. So you can see the difference. Um, and the Antarctic orca also have this dorsal cape that runs from the eye patch right up into the saddle patch there. And um, these are the fish-eating orca, and they're very, very chatty, just like the fish-eating orca here. They just the whole time. And so what we're trying to establish now is, are they also talking when they're going under the ice to feed, or is it just a socialising thing? So um, we're just beginning to work on that at the moment. But I'm hoping to get down there again this season. We're not sure whether we'll get funding for that or not. It's a continual theme that you'll hear 
for all researchers and all fields that work in biology. There's some amazing studies that have been done on where does money go that people donate. 97% of money that is donated around the world goes to something to do with humans. That leaves 3% for the environment, animals and everything else. So if somebody um, says to you, why do you donate money to animals and not humans, that's the little number that you can give them. <laughs> so if you want any more information about my research, um, the website's up there. And uh, this orca here, in fact, he's just been recited. We're on the Facebook page. We had a posting about him. And uh, he's doing really, really well. And yeah, it's nice to see, isn't it? And um, like I said, I'm, I'm off to New Zealand for a situation over there, and we'll, we'll keep you posted on that. So has anybody got any questions? Yeah. Why are why are Morgan and the others being put into the medical tank if they say there's nothing wrong? Yeah, why are they being put into the medical tank if there's nothing wrong? That's exactly what we say in the report. We, we observe them for the duration just prior to the show, during the show, and just after. That's all they let us do. You used to be able to see them through the gate, but because I took so many photographs and collected so much data, they put um, wooden gates up and they put these great big uh, canvas banners up everywhere so you can't see them outside the show times. But during those times, uh, they do not have any medical attention. There's no vets. The trainers barely take any notice of them at all. They're not provided with environmental enrichment while they're in the medical tanks. So um, we, we think that it's a com combination of things. They're just using it as holding tanks. Um, and that they're also doing it to keep uh, the animals away from me photographing them. But it's, it's pathetic in any instance. Yes? What's the scientific research that they're doing? What's the scientific <laughs> research that they're doing? Well, that's a very good point because when Morgan was being moved there originally, we challenged that because, okay, so just a little bit of back history, and Naomi knows this much better than I do, but there were originally four orca that were transported from the United States to Loro Parque. They went there. Um, from the US, they went as display animals, but they can only come into Europe as scientific animals. So on the plane flight, their paperwork changed. And this is what we're calling for. We're actually, as Naomi is doing, we're calling for a change in legislation, a change in the laws, and we're, we've actually proposed that it's called Morgan's Law um, as the, the common term for it, and that it will be to stop rescued animals um, being used commercially and for, for all sorts of things, but also in terms of cetaceans. And that, um, that there is a call so that CITES permits, you have to have the same purpose code, the same reason when they leave as when they arrive. That you can't change that in mid-flight, literally. So when they did this proposal to move these animals to Loro Parque, they put forward all these scientific studies that they were going to do. When Morgan went there four years later, not one of those had been done. So we said, well, this is ridiculous. You know, they, they've had four years, 24-hour access to these animals, and they haven't done the research. So now they're trying to push out all sorts of things. And, and Laurie and I have been discussing that they have been advertising that they have a paper that they have, are, are working on um, that we're aware of, but they have started telling the media that they've done all this research uh, and the paper actually hasn't been accepted scientifically. So they're, they're trying to push up their credibility, but in the scientific world, they're, they're dumbing themselves down because they, they're claiming for some science that they haven't done. But the, you can go on our website. We, we have mentions about what science they've done, and it's pathetic. Yeah. And as Naomi pointed out, none of these animals contribute to conservation. None of them. Yes? Yeah, sure, David. Uh, so Morgan came out onto the slide out, and uh, she sat there for a number of minutes. And there's a, there's a number of videos out there now of her doing it, and I've seen her doing it a number of times too. And the times that I've seen it, it's because she was trying to avoid aggression. An insider who is um, speaking to me at the moment, thank goodness, um, has told me that it's also because of sexual pressure from Quito, the male who killed Alexis Martinez. Um, so she's trying to avoid the sexual pressures. 
Uh, Tokoa does it as well. There's a video of him out there, and he uh, does it to avoid aggression. Um, he may also be doing it to avoid sexual pressures. Who knows what's going on in that dysfunctional group? Um, I mean, we know that there's male-male sex goes on in the wild, but the male-male sex is consensual. And what we're seeing with Morgan and with Tokoa is there's nothing consensual about this aggression or any sex that's going on. They, they just don't want it. Uh, so there was a lot of alarmist stuff saying that, the, that Morgan's trying to commit suicide. I don't think she's trying to commit suicide, but it was great for the media because they picked up on this and it went viral. Um, so um, as a scientist, I actually spoke out and I said, well, I don't believe that she's committing suicide. And so Laura Parker was all over that. They put in their blog, Dr. Ingrid Visser, who not first time they've called me Dr. Ingrid Visser, I might add. Um, Dr. Ingrid Visser, who normally is, is, a, activate, is an activist against Laura Parquet, says that Morgan is, is not committing suicide. Um, and I, I truly believe that. But there is a fundamental error in, in their thinking that I think that's okay. Because I also said, this is really, really wrong. It's very, very abnormal. And then, of course, they turn around and they say, you know what, this happens in the wild. Well, bullshit. Let's call them on that. Absolute, total bullshit. Nowhere in the world do these animals come out on concrete slides in the wild. <laughs> nowhere. And nowhere do they sit there for 10 minutes and just sit there, right? If they're coming out onto the beaches, it's either to hunt or it's training for hunting. So, or they've made a mistake. But it's certainly not normal what you're seeing in captivity. And the bashing on the gates... Um, that you've seen that video, incredibly stressed orca. No matter what Laura Parker tells you, this is not normal and it's not natural. And we discussed that in the report as well. So there's all these sorts of things and we discussed the beachings. So I encourage you to spread the word about the report too, please. And there's a whole lot of uh, media that's just started in One Green Planet, the Dodo. Uh, who else has done some stuff? Um, Huffington Post, and so if you guys can like that and share those, that's really great because that will help them spread, but also it bumps it up in the rankings for each of those websites, then it's more likely mainstream media are going to um, get these stories and, and they'll get out there. Dino? Yeah, when you pointed out where Morgan was uh, originally picked up, you said that she was captured here. Mm -hmm. Wasn't that a rescue attempt? I mean, technically? Okay, okay, so so she was captured because she was still free swimming, and the, and we use that term specifically for a number of reasons. One is that the industry has said up until just in the last month, actually, stranded, stranded, stranded. You read the scientific paper that they talk about longevity of orca in captivity. They list her as stranded. She never touched the beach. They got into the water to grab her, and yes, she needed help, absolutely. But a rescue, to me, is a rescue where the animal is rehabilitated and, and gets into a better life, not a worse life. Because that, to me, is not a rescue. So that's why we specifically use the term captured. And also, um, stranded and captured animals um, have different legal standing in the Netherlands. So we're very clear about that in terms of the legality of where she sits in the system. Yeah. I'll do a couple more questions and then I'm sorry guys, I'm going to have to bolt. Yes? Okay, it's not naive to ask about the Spanish government. It's a really interesting situation. So, okay, the Dutch government asked the Spanish government to ask Loro Parque, would they hold Morgan? Which they did. Now, in between that is SeaWorld. SeaWorld facilitated all of that because all of the orca at Loro Parque belong to SeaWorld, except Morgan, but all of the others. So SeaWorld at that stage desperately wanted her. She was the first orca in 13 years to come in from the wild. New blood, female, right? They would do anything for her. And they lied on their CITES application forms. They lied to the seven experts that they sent this to, including Dr. John Ford, who works around here. And, and when I gave him the true evidence, he flipped immediately, because originally he said, yes, Morgan cannot be released. When I showed him the evidence that we had, 
He wrote immediately, but the judge said, oh, you've been tampering with the witnesses. We're not gonna, we're not gonna take that evidence. So they only went with the original evidence. When I didn't tamper, I told them the truth. Yeah? Um, but all of the experts who were real orca experts all changed their opinions on whether Morgan should be released or not, and they all said she should be released. So fast forward to the Spanish government. We have asked them to please do something about Morgan. And they have said, well, the Dutch asked us to look after Morgan, so it's the Dutch problem. So we go back to the Dutch with this letter, and we say, look what the Spanish say. And the Dutch say, but it's not our problem. She's not here. So then we went to the American government, and we said, well, SeaWorld says that it belongs to SeaWorld, and you have the AWA and all your other laws that Naomi was talking about, and there's also this thing called comity, where um, it's basically reciprocal reflection of the law, and Loro Parque had signed a document that they would respect the animal welfare laws for those orca. So we said, under comity, we would like you to address this problem, and the Americans have said, not our problem. So the only people who can make a difference are sitting in this room and have a wallet. Anybody in the world who has a wallet can make a difference. Don't buy a ticket. It's the only message that's working. Yeah, there was one last question at the back there. Marco. Oh, this is going to be a hairy one. <laughs> We, we, Margot's saying, should we have an independent inspection? Margot, that is what we have been calling for from word go. Um, but we don't think that it's only the hearing issue, it's the welfare issue. How can somebody, a veterinarian, and you, you must remember, veterinarians are not all people who care about animals, because if they did, they wouldn't be working for a place like this, right? Um, just like there are bad, sorry, Jeff, bad doctors, and there's good doctors. <laughs> Um, there's bad veterinarians. I mean, there's veterinarians who work in slaughterhouses. So, you know, you, you have to remember that the veterinarians have problems. Um, we need to get a proper veterinarian in there to do an inspection too. And we have called on that. We've asked Wolfgang Kiesling, and he basically said that he wouldn't let me near the place because all I do is criticise him. And that the NGO, who is recognised by the Dutch government as a registered NGO, um, has no standing and is, is unacceptable. And so then we got together, um, it was about 1.5 million members belonging to 21 NGOs and asked for a, an inspection. And he hasn't responded to that letter and that's three years ago. So, you know, he replies when he wants to and he doesn't. Because it's private, we can't put any more pressure than the public putting pressure on with the voting. And I say this to folks, friends don't let friends go to Loro Parque. So if you know anybody anywhere that is considering going, please educate them. So on that note, I have to run. I'm very sorry, but thank you very much for having me here. <laughs> said it to a lot of you, it doesn't matter how much we talk, if you aren't there to listen and help spread our word, our words are meaningless. So um, we all work as a team and each of us is um, changing the world. So thank you. Thanks Ingrid. We all wish you a safe and pleasant journey back and 
I would normally give you a hug, but I know that you're not a hugger. So, well, I'm giving you a virtual hug right now. Have, have, a, have a good trip back and safe, and I'm sure that we'll speak to you and get an update from you um, when you're back in New Zealand. Bye. <laughs>